Welcome to the Ask Palestini podcast with a guest. I'm proud to present James Forster from Birmingham, United Kingdom, business entrepreneur, property guru, and controversialist. James has a proven track record in property development, sales, and investment across the UK and Europe. He's often featured commenting in the national press on property-related news. He has worked in property for 20 years and ran a number of property businesses across the UK. James, please tell us about yourself and how you started your business. What is your story? Yeah, so uh, great to be obviously on the podcast. So my name is James Forrester. Uh, I am uh, what people do say is a bit of a property entrepreneur uh, in different ways. Um, I have a estate agency, letting agent business across the West Midlands in the United Kingdom. Um, uh, covering obviously a lot of the various towns and the cities around the city centre uh, or outside the city centre. I also have a property development business where we build purpose-built student accommodation and residential property uh, in the West Midlands and the northeast of England uh, as well. So my story is very, very simple. Um, I went to Spain um, when I was just over 18 years old. Uh, like most people at 18, uh, especially uh, young boys, you're not really sure what you want to do in your life. Um, and I went over, I went to a timeshare presentation originally, uh, and that's what paid for me to fly out to Spain. Uh, I did that for three months um, and absolutely hated it. Didn't like the way it was being sold. Um, didn't like the concept uh, of buy weeks, buy points, et cetera, uh, at all. So I left that very quickly, but I, I wanted to stay in Spain, which was the Costa del Sol. Um, you know, the warm weather is a lot better than what we get here in the UK. Uh, especially, you know, 365 days, uh, very good weather against uh, probably two days of good weather. Um, but what happened, I left, I actually went to another timeshare company, but to learn all about the property management side of how you actually run developments uh, with, you know, service fees, for example, what it pays for, how you keep the grounds nice, the property nice, the repairs, the maintenance. So I did that for a number of years. And then I actually moved into a, a sales environment uh, to sell off-plan properties, uh, and I started selling uh, properties in 36 regions in 18 countries around the world. Um, so uh, it was very busy. You had to put a lot of hard work into it. Um, unfortunately, uh, in 2008, we obviously suffered a, a financial crash. Uh, and it was probably felt more in the overseas market a couple of years uh, in 2009 into 2010, uh, because you only bought overseas property if it was a luxury um, and of course, if people couldn't afford to buy, they, they literally were not buying. So I moved back to the United Kingdom uh, with the wife and the children uh, and went straight back into uh, property again, uh, but more on the traditional estate agency side uh, that would be helped. And of course, we've built up from there, from uh, building a great team around me, uh, using my knowledge from off-plan properties to work with property developers uh, mainly in the West Midlands, Manchester in the Northeast, uh, to get their products built, have them sold, make sure it's all done correct with the pricing. Uh, and that's what's led me into property develop development myself. So um, yeah, that that's pretty much my story. Um, you know, it's very simple. It's all been a good opportunity. And it was about taking risks at the time, you know, moving to Spain at such a young age, uh, there was no support, you know, to go there. It was very much of packing the bags, going, thinking it was going to be exciting. Um, and came back with a wife and two children. So, uh, yeah, something went right or something went wrong. It depends on how you look at that. Uh, so uh, a lot of different experiences and uh, from different regions, and then uh, you moved back home. So basically you have a global overview of the property market. However, you are utilizing this uh, global knowledge into your local market. Am I correct? Yeah, correct. I think, you know, especially the big difference between the UK and the overseas market is the, I would say the overseas uh, property marketing side of it is a lot better. Um, and using the strategies of how you have to promote developments, how you get early sales, what the benefits of getting in early uh, to developments uh, and, and these opportunities we've been able to bring to the UK uh, and make sure that, you know, developers and clients who are purchasing are, are getting the right value for their, for their money, um, you know, and making sure they're getting the right advice and information as well. Uh, when you're talking about development and your development business, is that more like a project management company or you also own a construction company? Uh, it's a bit of both. Um, so obviously we have the projects that we construct and then we build uh, ourselves. We obviously hand out contracts uh, for these. 
Uh, and then on the on the side of that, we have a property management business, so especially more on the student accommodation uh, as well, because most of our residential properties are sold to end users. But on the student uh, accommodation, we will then uh, uh, put the contract out for tender for the property management. And if one of our other companies and the people who are running that obviously can give a better presentation and what we're going to get, they will win the contract, but they will also go and win other contracts uh, with other developers to make sure that their properties are being managed correctly and are, are being rented to the right type of uh, students. Uh, in construction business all over Europe, there's a huge shortage of workers. How do you handle that? Do, do, do you have this problem or do you have your own team? How, how do you handle? No, we have the, we have the same issue here. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the uh, workers that we need are, are taken up by various companies. Um, so we, we are battling the same as Europe uh, in the UK. We're battling the same to make sure you can get the right workers. I think what's more important is not the workers. Um, because they come at different stages throughout the build. So you've just got to, have got to have a good build program. So, you know, when you need your infrastructure, you know, to when you need your uh, workers, to what you need your electricians at the back end for are completely different timings. What's probably you know, the hardest thing in construction at the moment is securing costs for the materials, securing the materials at the right costs. Uh, that's probably the most difficult uh, at the moment because costs have just been driven up um you know uh, on the materials so everything is increased in value and um, so that's one of the key elements in the construction world at the moment securing the materials at the right costs uh -huh. okay do you have any special um um trick how you do that Let, let's say advanced payment to the suppliers or how, how did I, I i imagine the cement uh prices went a bit up the the construction the wood prices is also the materials are also Wood uh, bricks. On the rise. Is yeah, there wood, any trick that, how you can hedge against that? Yeah, well, timber, concrete, bricks, you name it, everything, everything's gone up. There's nothing gone down. It'd be nice if we had something that went down. Uh, is there any tricks? Well, I can't give everything away, obviously, but there's not really any real special tricks on it. There, there is things where if you if you've got in your build, you need your cement by a certain time. Then of course, yes, if you're able to offer an advance payment to make sure that you're securing that date and you're fixing the cost, that's usually one of the number one uh, to be able to do because you want to make sure that one, it's in your build program, you're not going to feature any delays. You have to remember if you have a delay, you know, and you know, say there's a five week delay, well, that could may cost you a lot of money. You know, you, you know, it could cost you fifty thousand pounds, for example. So you want to try and cut your delays down as much as possible. Um, but we are, you are sort of in the hands of the supplier. You know, so even if you do pay in advance or, you know, you're paying deposits, but I'm aware of people who are paid full in advance have been promised dates and it still hasn't arrived on time, you know, so purely because, you know, of the demand, you know, that's been happening. Um, and also then the costs are changing. People will then say, look, we can't afford to give you that cost anymore. We'd rather refund you money and you're going to have to buy the new value as well. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is a tricky time for the construction world. Um, but but again, you adapt, you you know, you adapt and you change. That's the key thing. You know, you can't, what my advice would be, if you ask me if there's any tricks, is not to lose faith. You know, it, will, it is stressful. You know, you've got your team that are doing all the purchasing for you, you know, and they have to stay motivated. You know, and you have to, the key thing is motivating your staff to not lose faith, to make sure that they stay within their budgets, you know, and they can secure the right deals. And, you know, that's one of the key things is securing the right deal and getting the right timing. Are you caught in a, uh, let's say, uh, between the rock and the hard place because the, 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 the end clients are not eager to pay more because the interest rates are, are rising? Is that also an issue with you when you sell off plan? Um, it, well, when, you, when you're selling off plan, it, it, it's, it's a bit more difficult. It depends when the client's purchasing. If they're buying a, you know, say a three bedroom, two bathroom house, uh, two story to move in for, uh, as a first time buyer or obviously as a, as a family home, for example, mm -hmm. then normally they will buy anywhere between uh, when practical completion is about six months beforehand, because when they're securing a mortgage in the UK, they have to act within six months to take out the mortgage from the decision in principle. So it's more about the timing of when they are reserving the property rather than when the completion is happening. So, for example, today, um, you know, fresh off the press, we've had a, a new uh, increase in the Bank of England rates that will obviously affect mortgages. It will push them up slightly as well, but it's compared to what that that's my big answer at the moment. You know, what are we comparing it to? You know, since the financial crash, 
the rates went down and the Bank of England have effectively kept the rates very low. So people have got used to, you know, 1%, 2% mortgages, for example. In my opinion, the Bank of England have been caught sleeping at the, behind their desks. They should have increased the rates a lot, uh, many, you know, many years ago when, when things were doing very well, there wasn't a pandemic, the economies weren't being closed down. We should have seen increases then. Um, so it's all about reserving at the right time. The average interest rate in the UK in history is between three and 5%. So if you're comparing it to what the average is, well, to be honest, it's where we are now, you know, on this. But if you're trying to compare it, you know, to two years ago, five years ago, for example, then of course it's a bit more expensive, but there's a housing shortage in the UK. There's still a huge demand. Even today, you know, we have a lot of buyers coming through, a lot of people, you know, very serious buyers who want to get on the market. They're, they're moving for uh, for relocation purposes, for jobs. They need to be for schooling, uh, you know, in the UK. Typically, if they wanted to get into the right school, they've got to live within one mile radius, you know, as the bird flies, uh, you know, directly into that school. So, you know, I think if the numbers over a year dipped under 700,000, then I would be concerned. Um, but they're not. They're still around 900 to a million people are still moving on an annual basis. When there was a world crash, you know, they were still, they were doing around 700,000. So I've already now judged my figures on this to look, you know, as a world, as the world crashes and people were still, it's about 700,000 people were still moving on a yearly basis. Then at the moment. So, so you have your own statistic, how you, how you see uh, the, yeah, the. I don't, the I don't have the, the crystal, market. I don't have the crystal ball. Um, you know, if I did, I would pick out the lottery numbers, um, you know, and, uh, you know, I'd be, I'd be retired living somewhere. So, you know, but you have to do, you, you have knowledge is power. You have to do your homework. You know, mm -hmm. and when we're building off plan, everything's for the future. So we don't have the crystal ball, but you are able to study trends. You're able to see where markets should move. So as we're sat in the UK now, you know, it's great for overseas investors buying because the pound's relatively weak. So this is the time you want to be getting your money in. You know, the pound, it will get stronger. The government's very keen on getting the pound to be strong. There's two reasons for that. One, it's good for people like me going on holiday uh, to get more money for my for my uh, currency. Uh, obviously, well, obviously, if you're buying overseas as well, you're getting more for your money on that point. Uh, mm -hmm. But as I said, that's more of a luxury. The other one is if the pound's strong, then obviously you're buying in your oil a lot cheaper. You know, and mm -hmm. obviously that's what makes a lot of the world go around at the moment. And that has a big impact on inflation. So at the moment... The pound's obviously creeping up dramatically, you know, not dramatically, but it's creeping up a lot higher than what it was from about four or five months ago. Mm -hmm. So again, that's having a big impact. But um, as I say, for me, the market's still very strong. Uh, I know in the media, you will see, you know, talk of 30%, 35% uh, crashes, you know, in the price market, in the prices. We're not going to see that, you know. I'm pretty confident we will not see anything near that. Uh, you know, while, while we had a financial crash, the, the market dropped 19%. That was the world crashing, mm -hmm. you know, and, re and resetting. This is not that at all. Mm -hmm. There's too many regulations in place. People have to use bigger deposits now to purchase uh, on that. So I'm very confident that what we will see is a market sort of hold strong. Um, and then by quarter four of this year in 2023, I actually think we'll see prices slightly increase. Not a lot, but only maybe by 0.51%. Uh, but I think the market will will stay strong. There'll be less. It's a buyer's market. So it's all about people coming to the market at the right time, um, you know, and having the right prices. But I'm I'm not worried about the market at all. Okay. I, I'm glad to hear that you're optimistic about it. My uh, prediction for UK is also uh, positive. Mm -hmm. And I believe uh, Brexit will be um, really uh, good for UK in the long term. And I... I I, I think you're already reaping the benefits. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think look, I, I, you know, I'm quite happy to admit I voted Brexit. Um, you know, obviously we've just celebrated the third year anniversary. Um, I don't think the UK uh, government have taken advantage of it. Uh, I have my own reasons for why I did it. One, I've lived in an overseas country in Europe before, so I've seen both sides of how things can work. Um, I think there's a lot more benefits on it. I think we can trade uh, you know, with the EU without having all the regulations uh, attached to us. Um, I don't think we're feeling it. We haven't seen it yet. I think politicians have been lazy uh, to get this done. I don't. I think on the flip side, the European Union doesn't want the UK to be a success because obviously they're the first divorcee, if you want to call that, you know, as, the, as it's gone through, then you can't allow the country to be successful because everyone will think, well, why don't we just do that then? Um, so I think there's going to be a bit of, 
a bit harder for the first few years as we're coming out of it. But I think now's the time. I think now we're going to start to see the benefits really start to come through. Um, fingers crossed, obviously. Um, but I think that's... I'm really optimistic about it, especially with a new deal with India and new deal with China. That could be a breakthrough for you. Because then I, I, it would be hub for all the EU to, to India and to China. Yeah, look, absolutely. You know, if I take, if I take, you know, as a built, I build purpose built student accommodation, we rent a lot of uh, student property, mm -hmm. uh, you know, through our, our management company. But to, get, to give you an idea at the moment, you would say that the uh, Asian market for the Chinese is very huge, uh, you know, at it, but it's changing. Things are changing. Uh, you know, China's obviously put a few restrictions in place. Not many people are having as many babies anymore over in China, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from this. But for the universities to come, India and Sri Lanka will, and the African markets will catch up. Uh, by 2050, we will see the same, virtually the same amount of, say, Chinese students in the UK than we will see as uh, sort of the Indian and, and African uh, nations come through as well. So it's very exciting going forward. Again, because I'm building off plan properties a lot, I'm always... I'm years ahead of the way that I've got to think. Um, and it's about having that optimism. You know, if you think too short term, you won't be able to gain. You will get negative. You'll have negative thoughts about the market. You've always got to look forward about where it can be. Um, and take you, you have to take risks. So, you know, you've got to take calculated risks or gut feeling risks. It depends on uh, on how you operate as a person. Okay. Um, as an experienced uh, real estate a developer and also entrepreneur mm -hmm. what do you think would be the best um, business to get in as a first time buyer for example with uh, people that are just for our listeners that are about 40 years old they have re uh, repaid student debt in the us uh, they have now a bit of a spare money uh, they need to diversify they cannot invest everything in their own country mm -hmm. if they would come to uk what would be the best uh, property or the, which part of the market they should consider is that an off plant? Is that uh, buy to let uh, residential? Is then uh, that buy to let commercial? Uh, are these hotel rooms? Are these student accommodation? You, you mentioned student accommodation. What would you recommend for someone that would like to have uh, positive cash flow from day one and also uh, uh, rise in prices, for, for example, in the next 10 years? Okay, so I think there's, there's two things to that. Um, I personally think they should be buying uh, into purpose-built student accommodation from this because it will give a cash flow uh, on this for, it's about buying the right type of accommodation as well. It's not just buy, about buying cheap, you know, you need to buy into cities where the universities are very powerful. They've got a large number of students uh, coming through. The universities have got great plans. Um, you know, within the city itself and their expansion, because you've got to have that flow of students coming in um, constantly, and it will give you a very good cash flow. Most good purpose-built student accommodation will normally yield around seven percent net, you know, from 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 your investment, which is a very healthy return. It's not about being greedy; it's about being sensible. You know, and why I'm very much, you know, yes, you know, I have to declare I build purpose-built student accommodation, but there's a big difference on it. You know, it's about building what students want. It's not about what I want or, you know, you want where, you know, unfortunately, we're both too old now uh, for, you you know, for the university, you know, and the accommodation. So it's it's working what you know, the young people are after, what they want is an experience, you know, and like a lot of them are saying, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of research goes into this. There's a lot of surveys that are sent out and, and what we've seen is a shift you know, lately. But what a lot of students are asking for is they want to feel safe. They want to have a lot of students around them. Their rooms themselves don't have to be as big as they used to be, but they want great communal facilities, you know, from that. So they can have that full experience. And the good thing is, if you've got a happy student in your accommodation and in university, they're there to stay for a long time. You know, normally where we build, we will be looking at uh, uh, universities that really concentrate on people who are studying on a three, five, seven year term. So mm -hmm. they're there in the city for a long time, but it's going to give you a great cash flow. And it's a bit like now, you know, if you will, let's let's rewind this back. If you went back to 2008, 2009, you know, when there was a world, when there was a world crash, students still kept going to universities. Students still stayed in student accommodation, you mm -hmm. know, from, during COVID or pretty, you know, from the, you know, the horrible word that not many of us like to speak about, students still had to pay for their accommodation. They were still in their accommodation. So it was one of the best 
uh, or most resilient uh, property alternative property investments that you could have in your portfolio compared to say a buy to let, for example, within this. And that's cash flow. Student accommodation doesn't increase a lot in value because you're very much looking at the yield more than anything else. If you're looking for something that's going to go up in value, then it's a different type of investment. You've got to add what's the value you're adding to justify to get the extra value out of the property. Now, that can be buying a property that needs renovation and flipping it, for example, which I know is popular in the US and the UK. It's very popular as well. You know, on that. But like we know on that, it doesn't always mean you'll get the correct returns. You know, as you're, you know, renovating a property to buy your materials may increase throughout the build. You may go over time. You might be charged more money for it. Then you've got a lot of taxes on top for your capital gains for when you go to sell. So you might not always come out with the return or the high return that you're expecting. You've got to remember, property prices can go up and they can also go down. You know, mm -hmm. So, so let, let's return to student accommodation. What, what would be the minimum investment that you would recommend for student uh, accommodation? A, a, de a decent student accommodation should not be less than £100,000. So £100,000, is that for a room or...? Uh, that could be a, a room, a studio, uh, a apartment, uh, depending on the location. Of course, location will will dictate it, but anything that's really cheap uh, out there, so you will see things that are 40, 50, 60,000 pounds. Um, we don't know how they build them for that price. It costs more than that to build the actual mm -hmm. units uh, themselves. And you've got to think long term. It's not about the, the first figure that's put out there. You've got to look at the whole concept behind it. You know what is what am I getting for the money? You know, well, yeah, the total cost of ownership, so that you, you're yeah, not exactly. It's the cost of ownership. How is it going to be run? Why is it attractive to students? You know, why would they stay in your development more than anything? What's the demand in that city from students as well? How many beds do they need extra every year that's not being catered for? What universities are there? What are what are the plans from the universities? Why would people be going to these universities? There's mm -hmm. certain cities in the UK that are not doing as well. You know, on student accommodation. Because their universities haven't got that draw to come in. They haven't got that that expansion. They haven't, you know, they're not being as uh, uh, proactive enough to get out into the market and really bring that in. And that's that's very, very key to do that. Um, and that's what we're starting to see. And, and that's why I said, you know, £100,000 would be the bare minimum uh, to be that. I think the most successful ones that, you know, that we do and our competitors do, you would be paying £120,000, which, you know, to, as I say, to your listenership in the US, that would be quite cheap, you know, for, for what it would probably cost to some of most states. Uh, within that, the rooms would be a lot smaller, but it's a different type of market. The UK mm -hmm. students want the community facilities. You know, that's what they're after now. You know, they want to feel safe. They want to feel included. They, you know, they want their group study areas, individual study areas. They want that nice vibe. It's got to be Instagrammable, tick, uh, TikTokable, if that's a name, uh, on that. But they've got to have where it's cool. You know, it's cool to stay there. You know, from that, where you know, where's all the facilities? Where's the amenities? How far is it to walk to restaurants, pubs? You know, students are changing. You know, from you know, I didn't go to university, uh, but a lot of my friends uh, my age did, and they they were going out drinking all the time and partying. You know, students are all about, a lot of them, they still do that, of course, but a lot are now into wellness and health and, mm -hmm. and, and, their, men, and their mental well-being. And that's very important. And a lot of things we do is, is really focused on this now. Okay. So that brings us to another question, uh, to, to, uh, which is really similar. So uh, what would you do if you would be a first-time investor uh, with all your expertise, of course, uh, and uh, you would have 10,000, uh, 100,000 and 1 million to invest. How would you uh, invest that money in uh, property market in UK? Okay, so 10,000 pounds is not going to get you a lot, uh, mm -hmm. being honest. Um, you could try and work with uh, some property companies and maybe, you know, you can get uh, what's called uh, crowdfunding, for example, where you can put your money in, you might get a return, um, you know, on that. You've got to look at what you're probably going to get for £10,000 is not going to be, it wouldn't be attractive enough, you know, really, especially if you're coming in from overseas, um, your bank charges will probably eat most of that up, you know, as you get an income and an outgoing uh, transfer. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you would need to increase it, you know, a little bit. I think the bare minimum, if you were going to do sort of any crowdfunding or even working with a developer, you know, where, where they can do, they, they will take your money to help build the project themselves and, and they will do a contract to say that they will give you a certain return over a certain period. 
uh, a time frame, you know, on that, and that might work better for you. Um, if you're at hundred thousand pounds, then I would start to look at cash. You could do the same as that. Absolutely. You could put it into that, but you, usually when you're at around the hundred thousand, you've got to look at your strategy different. You're either going to go, I want to own assets that, you know, that are normally yielding high yielding assets, uh, or you're prepared to put it in with a developer to get a return. You don't want any, uh, any hassle of ownership. You don't want to have anything registered, for example, and you just want to go, I want to give you that money. What are you going to give me back? You know, so am I going to get, you know, if I give you a hundred thousand pounds, are you going to give me a 10% return over 12 months, for example, that could mm -hmm. be quite attractive. Uh, and if it's coming from overseas, it's now the time to do this because while the pound, you know, it has increased slightly. So, you know, you want to get in now because once the pound's high, that's when you want to be taking your money out and putting it back. Yeah, in. because you get then double return one on the, you'll, you'll get the benefit of the exchange yeah. rate. Yeah, of course. And if it was a million pounds, then I would be speaking with developers uh, you know, we work with investors like this, you know, and they will say, look, we've got the funds available. We like what you do as a company. You know, we want to work with you. This is what's here. What can we do? You know, are you looking at sites at the moment? How do you think you can utilize that money? What sort of return you would get? And we have open and very frank conversations. It's not the case. You just give me a million pound and, you know, we do what we want. You know, it's all dealt with, you know, proper legal contracts, solicitors example, you know, where we lock it down to go right. This is what we're going to do. And everyone's very clear and transparent on, on how it works. That's what I would be doing with a million pounds. I think you'll get a much better return. There's a, obviously there's risk involved, uh, you know, on that. So you could separate your million pounds. You could, you might do, I'll buy three or four units, you know, for example, at a hundred thousand uh, pounds a unit. And, I'm, and then I will do the same, you know, might buy five and then do half a million to invest. So there's very different ways that you can spread it. It all depends on what your appetite of risk is. You know, and normally the higher risk, the bigger returns, you know, I think you've got to look at more of the medium sized risk where you can see exactly what the money is going towards, you know, exactly what the developer's building, for example, if we're looking at this route, you know, and then normally you would get a higher return, you know, for your money on that rather than being, you know, a, a huge risk. Um, but you've got to decide what you need. You know, if you've got that money and you're thinking, be very clear, write down what you're looking for and then have various conversations with people and say, look, this is the money that's available. You know, I need to know what, would, why, how you could use it, what the return would be. Am I going to be comfortable with it? Why would I use your company, for example? Mm -hmm. So basically, if I understand correctly, uh, student accommodation would yield about 7%. Uh, you can get in certain areas you may get higher um but on a net yield not a gross on a gross you might see eight and a half nine percent obviously of course you've got service charges yeah, you know, yeah to run the building correctly uh seven but look even if you were getting six percent if you were getting six percent uh every, every year with no void periods every single year you know for 10 years for example then you're doing very well on your property investment you know you would then be looking at it going yeah. if i took my money out where what would I be able to get for that money to get that return? And the answer is probably very little. Okay, I'm I'm a skeptic about this because the inflation in UK is uh, higher than seven percent right now. So, but it is. But you're buying you're buying with cash. You're not borrowing the money. So obviously, that yeah, yeah. But but the inflation is real. So I will get less uh, than than what I invested in if 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 I go out uh, next year. That is a problem. You can you can look at that. Look, I'm not a financial expert. Mm -hmm. But if you looked at any property at the moment, you wouldn't be getting more than inflation. So it's irrelevant. It's inflation short term. You know, inflation can go up. You have to deal with it for a few months and then it can drop. Happens at any marketplace. When you buy, no, I, I agree with that. That, that is why I'm uh, always looking for or recommending because I, I also do work as a treasurer. I <laughs> recommend to my clients that they uh, look in two ways. So the increase in price needs to offset the uh, inflation. And there needs to be some yield to um, to 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 be higher than the interest rate. Okay, it's an interesting concept that I look. I'm all for property because property prices can go up and go down, and I think everyone's got to be very realistic on that. Uh, you know, on on that point, you can always have a blip in the market that that can change it. Yielding properties are very different. You know, inflation's already started to come down in the UK. You yeah, know, I, I, I see good. positive trend. I, I believe that uh, UK UK will start right now. I think I think what you I think it's a, I'll just be very but I think it's a very dangerous game when people look to try and get much higher returns, you know, on a property market. That's not sustainable long term. What you have to do is look long term with solid income, and then they're usually the winners in the property market.
Yeah, I agree. A ten-year period for sure. I'm I'm hundred percent on 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 you, uh, on on your side with that. Uh, and now uh, let's get to our next topic. Uh, what did you have to do to be featured? Uh, common thing in the national press on property related things. Uh, how did you become the the expert that uh, that media is looking for uh, for for advice? Usually, I say different to everybody else. I'm, I'm a bit I'm a bit uh, controversial on some of my comments. Uh, you know, from that, but it, it's knowing, it's it's having the knowledge. It's and as I say, like early, it's studying the trends and know exactly what you're talking about. You know, I think that's the key thing. If you're going to go and do, you know, being on the media and you're being asked, for example, you've got to be honest. You've got to be transparent. You know, and and know exactly what's going on in the marketplace. But you've got your own opinions, but you have to stand by them. You've got to be prepared to change them because no one knows what might happen in the marketplace. You know, from that, but I've not been wrong since Brexit yet. Um, so you know, my property, you know, everyone before Brexit was property prices will crash, they're gonna fall off a cliff. Well, they haven't, they've increased. Pandemic, mm -hmm. everything's gonna crash, everything's gonna go wrong. Well, it hasn't, it's done the exact opposite. Last year I started saying, look, 2023, we're gonna see a huge change in the market. Things will flatline for a bit, we'll just see a plateau in the market, and then we might see a little bounce towards the back end and that's what exactly what we're seeing now now i'm not perfect i don't have that crystal ball but i study trends I, stats don't lie you know and that's a key thing if you study the trends and study all the statistics then you will normally get a good picture from that and also you've got to have a positive outlook in life things can go down things can go wrong but if you if you get sucked into believing all the negative headlines which sell you know Positive headlines don't sell in the media, mm -hmm. you know, negative headlines sell, but you've got to stick with your instincts, you know, and you, but you've got to be able to justify what they are. I can't just, you know, I can't just go on a, a you know, a radio station, TV, be featured in, a, in the national press as I am and just go, oh yeah, your headline's completely correct. Um, you, you know, for example, I think it's totally right. To the, it, it's boring. No one wants to hear that. What they want to hear is industry experts, you know, on what they're exactly thinking at the time. And what I will do is if it's wrong, that headline, I will fight back on it. And I will say, well, actually, that's not the case. You know, this is what's happening at the moment. And I have I have journalists who have contacted me uh, on this who have then gone, we can't feature you because we don't agree with what you're saying. And I went, no, you don't agree with the story you're trying to write. There's a big difference. You know, uh -huh. you're after a scare story. Well, unfortunately, my stats and my statistics and everything else that I've got, what I'm seeing in the day-to-day -day world, because the media is here and now, it's not what's going to happen in 10 years or three mm -hmm. years, it's about it here and now. I went, we're not seeing it. We haven't seen what you're trying to report. So how can I honestly say, well, yes, I think it's going to drop. I don't want more. I don't need followers on my social media. That's not my agenda or anything like that. It's about having a true reflection. It's about having a healthy debate, comment on it and say, well, actually, you're saying this. Well, what about this? That could change it all. We have very low unemployment in the UK, you know, at the moment. It will probably increase. You know, I think unemployment will increase, you know, with what's going on at the moment, but not to the levels that we have seen when things have gone wrong. There's a lot of wealth creators in the UK, a lot of startups, a lot of entrepreneurs starting companies, you know, who are, who are big recruitment drives as well. So, like I said earlier, you have to adapt and change. And that's why I do a lot of commentary now in the media. It's why I've been chosen to speak uh, a lot in the media is to offer the balanced view of actually look, just look at the market very differently. Don't read the headlines, study the market, speak to people who study the market. For example, there's, very, there's pe various people like me who will do this and offer a balanced view. Like I said, property prices may come down. They may go up, they may go down. That is fact. You know, rental mm -hmm. may go up, may go down. But we study the trends to go, look, it's going to plateau at the moment. It's going to be difficult. There's a cost of living crisis, especially in the UK, probably more than most places, you know, because we obviously import a lot more than, than obviously what we have homegrown. Um, so we have to change policies in government to, to make the UK a more, uh, to, not, to, to be less self-reliant, to be more self-reliant and not reliant on other countries. But that okay. really has impacts. So to sum up, uh, in order to be featured in the media, uh, you need to use honesty as your best policy, study trends, and uh, have positive attitude. That yeah, and, don't, and, don't, and also and don't be afraid to fight back to the uh, to the journalist or the, the media mm -hmm. commentator if, they, if they're asking you. Don't 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 be afraid. If your views are different, then that's exactly what they are. You have to say, look, my views are X. 
You know, don't be afraid mm -hmm. and just go, I totally agree. Um, you know, it's going to, at the end of the day on the media, it's going to be a good show as well, you know, from that. Otherwise, it's boring. Yeah, and that brings us to the next question. When did you um, become aware that uh, you were an influencer? You said it's not important to you, your uh, views, your um, your likes and all this stuff, but you are an influencer. W when did you become aware of that? Um, yeah, see, I wouldn't say I'm an influencer, to be honest. You know, I'm just a, a property person. That's what I am, um, you know, at that point. I think I think for how people will look at it is, is the knowledge, knowing the market, uh, as I said, uh, and just being, and being transparent with clients, you know, to turn around and just say, you know, look, you know, if someone's looking to move at the moment, for example, their home, Everyone will be like, yeah, you should move. If you're getting it, you know, I own an estate agency and let an agent. So, you know, obviously I have my stuff. You know, the, their question will not be, I need you to sign a contract to sell your property because we get paid commission. Their question is the same as what I would be asking is, why, why do you need to move? Mm -hmm. and, it, and, it, and that gives you a different answer. You know, it's not because I want to or I want a bigger home. It's like, well, why? You know, do you actually need to move home at the moment? You know, which sounds horrible because you think, God, you're turning business away. But if it's not right for that person to move at the moment, then a good property person would be advising the client not to move. It's not about out, you know, it's not about us earning money, you know, you know, and everyone thinks that, you know, property people are greedy and, you know, we earn fortunes. We don't, you know, we're not greedy. We go through a lot of tear and heartbreaks and, and risk a lot for, for what we do, especially more in the development world, I, I would say. But, yeah, you know, I'm an influencer. I wouldn't say I'm an influencer on it. I would just say, you know, I've been in this market now 22 years. I, I've learned, uh, I've got a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience. I've seen a lot of bad, you know, and I've also seen a lot of good, you know, on that. And I think now it's the journey of starting to share it more so people can learn learn about the property market as well. You know, I don't sell courses, for example. You know, I'm not here to go, you pay me X amount of money and I will educate you how to do it. That's not my style, you know, at all. I don't I don't believe in them sort of things, to be honest. You know, I think you should be able to sit down with people uh, and have good, honest conversations. And look, and if you like what they're going to do, you should be using their services. You know, I think where people can go wrong is then they'll go, thank you for all your information. I'll go off and do it myself. And then it goes wrong and then they come back and blame you, you know? So I think it's just, be, just be transparent. Be yourself at the end of the day, be yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with all your businesses that you have going on, so with agency, with development um, and all the other stuff that you do, uh, how do you balance your private and work life? Is there a balance? Uh, so so uh, this is where I'm very controversial. Work comes first to me. So work actually comes before my family. It sounds horrible. It always has, um, you know, from a very young age, uh, I've always put work first. It's drilled into my head. Uh, you know, when I'm, when, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to change a bit more now. I am trying to spend uh, more time uh, as a family person. Um, I can't put my phone down. I'm constantly checking emails. I am constantly working, you know, from that. Um, is it good for your health? No. Uh, is it good for your family life? No, uh, on that. But I think when you are, is it trained and it trains probably the wrong word, but when you are so focused on, on building things, you know, which is creating jobs, you know, I get, I get a lot of happiness by being able to employ people and, and see them develop, you know, throughout the years. I think that's a great satisfaction uh, to, uh, to see people do this and then move on, you know, they will move on. They'll move on to other companies and they'll, they'll, they'll start, you know, you know, taking their career to the next level. I think that's the best satisfaction you can ever have from running a company is seeing people obviously do this you know, on this, or come along the journey with you. And they go from, you know, my, my I started making the tea for the boss and then become, and then became a director of the company, you know, you know, at the time. And I've gone through the whole stage there. Um, but yeah, I put work first. Um, you know, I do a lot of traveling. Uh, I've been able now to have a bit more time uh, away. So I like to travel around Europe uh, and see many places. And it's all about architecture when I'm away. You know, I always look at the stage, it's windows. I want to see what the property prices are. I like to walk in and have a chat with them. Um, so I am a bit of a, a, a property nerd, if you want to call it this. You know, it is very much my life. But without it, and I, it's, this will sound strange, without it, I probably wouldn't have the family that I have today uh, or, or or the things that, you know, we've been fortunate. You know, we've bought the house that we wanted, you know, you know, and things like this. And these, these things mean more. But w without my drive, you know, will the company, you know, have, you know, when things go wrong, 
you know, people look up to the, the person at the top and they want that enthusiasm, that passion, that drive to pull them through the tough times. Anyone can sell property in good times, you know, you know, things like it's, it's not, it's not, it's not hard in the good times to sell property. Good estate agents, developers who are selling property. It's in the bad times. That's when, you know, you, you're good at what you're doing because you've got the trust. You're being transparent. You are showing the benefits you know, of why it's the right time to be able to purchase or it's the wrong time and you shouldn't be doing it. But people then might go, you know what? That's right. I don't need to move, but I have five properties that are let that I would now like you to manage for me, you know, and it's been, it's having that overall, don't just be so focused on one thing, you know, it's about being there. So yeah, to answer your question, I put work first, um, okay. you know, and then, and then family second, unfortunately. We touched one topic before uh, we started the interview. Uh, you you were running for charity. Yes. Uh, is that never your again, never sport? Again. No, no, not not again. <laughs> too, too difficult. Uh, do you have any uh, sports that uh, you do or? Um, uh, I like regularly? playing. I like playing darts in the bar. If you can call that a sport. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, ten pin bowling because I can have a beer at the same time. If that's a sport. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No. Look. If you came back to the charity, uh, it's a charity I support in the northeast. Um, mm -hmm. they they uh, they have disadvantaged uh, uh, young uh, children and adults uh, from that they ever have various you know its disabilities for example uh, the um, I, I've always from a very young age uh, had an admiration for uh, I think some of these young people are an asset uh, you, you know to the world uh, and they just don't get the right type of opportunities unfortunately uh, it's just the world that we live in uh, and people look at it very different and this is a charity that's created a business to give people the and it sounds horrible are very unlikely to get uh, a job uh, you know with many with many many companies so they have given people an opportunity to work for their companies to really push forward and given them life experiences that probably would miss out everywhere else uh, it really touches my heart um, so I've supported them now for uh, for a couple of years uh, when I've met them. And then they asked me would I run the Great North Run, uh, which is probably the most popular half marathon uh, in the world, I would say, not just the UK. Uh, it's in my hometown of Newcastle upon Tyne. So stupidly, I said, yes, I'll do that. I don't run. Um, and yes, I did the 13.3 miles, I believe it is. Uh, yes. Just over three hours. Uh, I did one training run. Um, you know, my my stupid brain was going, it'll be fine, don't worry about it. Ooh. It was tough. I was in tears. Uh, my feet hurt. I could hardly walk for a week afterwards. Uh, <laughs> but, but I but I raised a few thousand pounds for the charity, Ooh. which will go a long way. So I'm glad I'm glad I've done it. I'm not doing it again. Uh, a couple of my staff are doing it this year now for the charity, and I will be there to support them uh, on that. But um, other sports wise, I'm a huge football fan. Uh, mm -hmm. from that but that's watching football now rather than play it I do a lot of mountain walking uh, and hiking so if I had to really break down the sport the sport on it it would be you know if it's not sport it is getting out and about uh, would be mountain walking which I it's great the phone's in my pocket it's switched off you know I only take it out to take photos and and I'm I can I'm literally on my own and I can just enjoy it okay great so let's move to another topic that you're good at uh, this is politics Okay, yeah. So uh, we touch a bit about Brexit and all the opportunities that uh, Brexit brought to uh, UK market. Yeah. Uh, w what is your stand on, let's say, political view of the economic situation? How, how, uh, how do I, think the, I think the Conservatives are doing useless. I think, I think we don't have any good MPs in the country. I think they're all pretty much useless. Um, they've either been born with a silver spoon in their mouth and they don't know how real people live or have any concept of how you deal with day-to-day -day issues, you know, all together. Or on the flip side, you have, you know, uh, more down-to-earth MPs, but their ideas will never work, you know, from that. And I, I, I think politics in UK is broken. It's, it's, it's one of the least trusted professions. Full stop. Here, um, I sort of like the American model slightly, the where you are. What I mean by that is, is if you are the president. You can choose who you want as your top team. So if you want someone to talk about the medical world, you can get the best doctor to be in your top team. Where well, you can't do that in the UK. You, know, to get, you might have an advisor, but you can't have it. It's got to be an MP that's been elected by the people. You know, 
you know, we all like to have a bit of knowledge about everything, but you can't know. You don't know how to run the NHS, for example. But, you know, you know, and if we look at it at the moment, you know, that's a big topic in the UK, uh, you know, on this. But we have, you know, a health minister that really is not not that involved in it, you know, altogether. They just move jobs. So for me, I'm very, I love politics. Um, you know, I think you have to be vocal, you know, but you've got to be healthy. As I said, I think a lot of them are not great. Um, some of them do come up with some good ideas and that push, but I just want, I just want our politicians to just be, a, to be more aggressive in a way. And I'm trying to be careful of my words here of what I can actually say on your podcast. Cause I can be a bit, I can be a bit too blunt sometimes. But they've just got to get a bit of oomph, you know, and go, yeah. you know what? Um, you, might not, you might not like change, but this has got to happen. You know, if you well, want what do you think? What do you think about the idea that uh, the king would have more influence that 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 uh, he has now? Would that be a good idea for for uh, for uh, UK? Um, I think the monarch should always stay out of politics. Mm -hmm. To be honest, um, I think it's but, good. But, but the king has some really good ideas about uh, ecology, and so. Uh, should should that just be his hobby or uh, should, should he I, I think he should that? be allowed to voice his own opinions without mm -hmm. a shadow of a doubt. But I don't think it should influence policy. And I think that's uh -huh. a key thing because, you know, if you're the king, let's be honest, you've got everyone working for you. You know, you're not going to a coffee shop to buy a coffee, for example. You're not worried about how to make your next mortgage payment or meet your rent payments or can you pay your, your, your you know, your children need new trainers. Can you afford it? These things. They're not, they're never going to know about that. You know, that's not the world that they live in. So they can be very passionate. They can have charities. Uh, I believe they can be passionate, as you say. You know, obviously, I know King Charles obviously is very passionate about, uh, you know, the planet should be very green, etc. But you can't influence policy because of what he wants, you know, from that. I think they should have their own opinion. They can address it in speeches, but policy has to stay separately. Policy is about what's right for the country going forward and how it affects, you know, people like myself and everyone else, you know, who are paying taxes into the system, you know, how that will mean, will it be better? And it should always be, whatever comes in place should always be better. Unfortunately, it's not always the case at the moment, especially at the moment. So, so to sum up, you're not a royalist. Uh, I, I love the royal family. I think the royal family is great, especially when well, we get. A, I understand, but uh, especially when we get a bank holiday. You, you I believe in separation of of uh, of uh, I the think monarchy we, and uh, the, the the politics. I wouldn't, you know, you know, as I say, I'm a royalist. I think I think the UK has to have a royal family. I think mm -hmm. they bring in a lot of revenue, you know, into the UK. I don't mind that our taxes go to pay for the royal family, you know, at all uh, from that. I just think that. The work they do is very different. They should, the, the, to me, they should do a lot of charity work, which they do because they can mm -hmm. have a lot of influence that way. And I think they should have a big role in about making the UK be very attractive, you know, to the outside world. But when it comes to homegrown politics, then that's got to be dealt with at another level. Yeah, I, I'm I'm a bit biased because I I got a lot of help from them in the past, so uh, <laughs> I'm not the one. That's why I'm pushing a bit. Or uh, I'm, I say I'm, I'm looking for I'm looking forward to the coronation because we get an extra day off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is also good. So um, to sum up our uh, interview, um, the best thing to invest in uh, if you want a positive cash flow. And if you want to invest, let's say, 100,000 to start with, probably you cannot start with less than 100,000, if I understand correctly. Correct. Uh, would be something like student accommodation, sometimes something special. That purpose, uh, purpose built student accommodation. Huh? So purpose built student it's accommodation. It's a big difference, not just uh, any old student accommodation. Okay, so purpose built student accommodation uh, in the place where the university is strong and Correct. has some. Um, future plans so that yeah. there's going to be a growth in the future correct um and that should be uh, structured with a legal advisor and all this stuff so that uh, our american listeners don't lose money when investing in the first student accommodation in uh, you, should, you should never buy a property regardless what it is in the uk without uh, using a lawyer in the uk mm -hmm. so um is there any tip that you would like to share with us, uh, and w w could our could our um, listeners just contact you if they would like to invest hundred thousand or a million in, in in UK? Would that be um, a, a good advice just to somehow sum, sum things uh, up? 
Yeah, look, they can, you know, for me, they can they can then approach the company. We'll speak to them and have that, you know, talk and that advice with them. I think the tip is you've got to, you know, you've got to be honest with what you want for your money. You know, there's no point going, you know, I want capital appreciation, but I want a really high yield. The two normally don't go together. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. So, you know, so you've got to be realistic. Yeah, you know, and 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 for any investor, I will say, what is your goal? What do you want? To, what do you need out of the money? You know, what's your goal over the medium and long term? You know, from that, and that will allow you to have a much more blunt conversation about how things work, it, regardless if it's student combination, buy to let, you know, you know, a uh, buy to flip, things like this, for example. You know, working with a developer, it just allows it to be very clear, very upfront, and transparency is key in this marketplace. You know, you, you hear about a lot of people being burned, uh, as in they've lost money, it's not gone right for them, etc. And there will, there, there's always three sides to the story. There's theirs, yeah. the, 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 the the state agent, developer, property person, and the truth, you know, on that point. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree 100% with you. But that, just, is, that is property I, all over the world. It's, it's yeah, the same. Yeah, and I'm just very blunt. Be very transparent. Be upfront. When we speak to investors and we'll go, look, they've got, they've got money they want to invest, we will be asking them, what are you looking for, first of all? We want to know the clients. We want to know all about them. You know, from that, it's our decision to just like their decision is to who they want to use. It's our decision to design. Do we accept it or not? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's different. I turn around. I turn away a lot of investors, you know, who want to invest with the company. They see developments that we are coming out and they want to get involved at an early stage. And one speaks to them. I just think you're just not the right fit for us. You know, mm -hmm. I don't need. I don't need the hassle. You know, I, you know, you're not in the right stage of your investment career of when you should be getting involved. In my own opinion, you know, from this, and I would rather be blunt and upfront like this because when you're investing with people's money, um, you know, and, and or people are buying property through you, you've got to be unbiased. You've got to look at it an unbiased view to go, am I a good fit for you? And are you a good fit for me? And if you both are, then great, move on, you know, and get get the business done together and, and, and enjoy and enjoy it. But if not, you're better off just walking away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. I will include your uh, contact details in the description so our listeners can uh, contact you if they think that you would potentially be the right fit for them. Uh, thank you, James, again, for all this wonderful insight and for being my guest tonight. Thank you. We enjoyed it. Thank you.